Over the last five years, 54 people have lost their lives on our roads. A further 123 people have suffered serious injuries, often lifelong injuries requiring care, as a result of drink driving being a contributing factor. Uh, we know uh, that uh, a large part of our cohort who uh, continues to drink and drive are 20 to 40 year old males who effectively are selfish pricks for actually driving on our roads whilst drink driving. The reason that we think this is the case is because we know through extensive market research that these people continue to drink and drive for, for their own self-interest essentially. It's because they don't want to leave their car at the pub or at a friend's place. They don't want to sleep on the couch, they'd rather sleep in their own bed. They want to perhaps spend a few more dollars on a couple, a couple more beers or a couple more drinks rather than paying for a ride home. Now it's these types of selfish, um, irresponsible behaviours which we know from the market research uh, is part of the reasons why people still continue to drink and drive. To put it into perspective, over the last five years, over 25,500 people, so let's say it again, over the last five years, 25,500 people have been detected for drink driving in South Australia. Of that number, nearly 11,000 of those drink drivers are males aged between 20 to 40 years of age. So that over the last five years, there's been essentially nearly 11,000 selfish pricks driving home whilst they've been drinking. The message today is very clear. Don't be a selfish prick and drink and drive. Uh, take responsibility for your actions. Uh, take into account uh, the responsibilities of you as a road user. Stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about the other people that you are impacting by your irresponsible behaviour of drink driving. We make no apologies uh, for the aggressive uh, nature of this campaign. It is specifically designed to start conversations and to start people thinking, particularly the target audience, about their behaviours and continuing to stop the damage that drink driving does on South Australian roads. As I said before, 54 lives lost, 123 people seriously injured over the last five years. This is the next step in our campaign to try and reduce the number of lives lost, the carnage on our roads, by minimising the amount of people that drink and drive. And can I say, for those of you, for those selfish pricks out there who continue to drink and drive, you will get caught. Uh, we will continue to enforce this aggressively and you will be held accountable for your actions. I now like to hand over to the Minister. That's AC. The message is very clear. If you drink and drive, this is where you could end up. In a more cold and alone. We know that uh, last year alone we lost 17 lives on our roads where uh, drinking and driving was a significant influence. We know that over the last five years, uh, over 40% of fatality crashes have involved uh, people who drink and drive. It's just absolutely not good enough. Unfortunately, the messaging has got to be more confronting and hit much harder for some. As we've heard, uh, young men especially, 20 to 40 years of age, who are out there uh, driving, especially in the country areas, uh, on the roads late at night, especially on the weekend. Uh, we're seeing, we've also seen an example recently, uh, someone that was caught multiple times over uh, the legal plate alcohol concentration limit. It's just not good enough. Uh, it's incumbent upon everyone to do the right thing on our roads, but for some, uh, we need to be more hard-hitting in our messaging. And that's why we're launching this campaign here at South Australia Police today. The message is very clear. If you drink and drive, this is where you could end up. Alone, cold, and in a morgue. You've got to be a death wish driver. You've got to have a death wish. If you, if you drink and drive, this is where you could end up. The consequences are very serious. We've lost 31 lives on our roads this year compared to 29 at the same time last year. Uh, this carnage on our roads has got to stop and it is preventable and it is avoidable but we've all got to do our bit. Don't drink drive, do the right thing on our roads. Questions for the AC or the
Uh, how effective do you think it will be with that cohort between 20 to 40 years? I mean, if they're already out doing this sort of reckless behaviour, do you think an ad's really going to hit home for them? Um, all the market research that uh, we've conducted, and it has been extensive, um, says that uh, it does actually reach out to this particular cohort. Now, this is the type of language that this cohort uses. Um, what we're hoping is it actually starts a conversation. It starts a conversation with mates, it starts a conversation with families. Uh, really gets into the, the minds of the people who are making these decisions because we're not necessarily talking about um, those people who go out every single week and, and drink and drive and, and, and generally have a complete disregard for the law. We're talking about those people who make a, a impulsive decision sometimes, a selfish decision to drink and drive just for their own convenience. Um, so we are really confident that uh, this will resonate particularly with the target group we're looking at this. Uh, will it coincide with the police blitz at all? Uh, that's going to be rolled out anytime soon? Absolutely. We've got a drink and drug driving campaign uh, on again this weekend, uh, as we do quite regularly as part of our enforcement process. You know, I, I, again, time and time again, I remind people that we've got not only the static driver testing stations, but also every single police car out there can pull you over anytime, anywhere for drink or drug driving. So, you know, you just if you're going to take the challenge, you're going to get caught. And, and you know what? At the end of the day, you're lucky if you get caught. Because as the Minister said, you can end up in the morgue, you can end up in the hospital, you can end up in a rehabilitation facility for months or years, um, and you could end up being uh, required long, uh, requiring long-term care, which uh, your family or other members are going to have to, gonna have to uh, deal with. Is it frustrating to have to reiterate the same message over and over again? Yeah, it is absolutely frustrating that, uh, you know, as I said, 25 and a half, over 25 and a half thousand people in the last five years have been caught drink driving. And this is why we continue to refresh uh, our marketing campaigns. It's a really important part of uh, the process and the approach that SAPOL has to road safety. Um, we have our enforcement elements, obviously. We have our education elements through schools and other means. But this marketing is just specifically designed to refresh the messaging around which, like I said, despite decades of actually pushing this messaging out, we've still got thousands of people drinking, drink, drink, uh, driving every year. Um, can you tell us a bit more about the um, blitz that you've got happening this weekend? What, what's it? Uh, yes, yeah, so it's uh, running uh, basically, I won't give you the exact times and dates for obvious reasons, um, but uh, we are running a drink and drug driving statewide operation. Uh, so there will be both static and mobile random breath testing uh, stations across the state. Um, despite the fact that we're running a dedicated operation this weekend, as I said, you can get caught anytime, anywhere. And what about um, Easter coming up as well? Uh, <coughs> what plans are sort of have been set in place there to make sure that we try and make sure it's a fatality free weekend? Yeah, uh, look, March uh, was a horrific uh, long weekend, uh, one of the worst in about a decade, I think, in terms of uh, lives lost. And, you know, I think sometimes we can become desensitised to the fact we talk about lives lost, but we're talking about families here who have been impacted forever. Uh, March long weekend will forever in their families be something that they dread um, coming forward. You know, it's not just about the lives lost in terms of figures and things like that. This is the impact that it has on families and, and friends and broader communities as well. So we are really ramping up, as we do every Easter, we are really ramping up our activities um, so that we can try and uh, do our best to prevent people from killing themselves or killing other people on the road. At the end of the day, road safety is everybody's responsibility. Um, we expect that people do the right thing and luckily the vast majority of our community do do the right thing. Um, so again, coming back to this campaign, it is about targeting that specific cohort but others who choose to be selfish and drink and drive. Will there be any new um, sort of strategies this Easter that you can reveal to us? Well, at the moment, you'd be aware that we've um, had a horrific uh, run in the Barossa Valley in particular, um, with a, a number of lives lost uh, so far this year. Um, we have really stepped up um, our visible presence in the Barossa at the moment um, to make sure that we remind people that, uh, particularly in that area, um, that and, and anywhere in the state essentially, but the Barossa at the moment. Uh, we are specifically targeting and again ahead of the uh, east long weekend. I think uh, if you are travelling over the east long weekend, you can expect to see a very large presence on the highways to and from the regional areas. Uh, again, to make sure that people are doing the right thing. Uh, and in the city and CBD and suburbs, um, there we are again a very high police presence, focusing on road safety. So, as always, um, we implore everybody to have a great weekend, um, but plan ahead. Um, if it's travelling to state, plan ahead if you're going out for a few drinks so you don't have to drive uh, and, and have a safe weekend on the roads. Is there any reason why the Barossa has been so, so particularly bad just recently? 
Uh, look, it's really hard to pinpoint because there are a number of different um, crashes that have occurred and a number of different vehicles that have um, been involved in those crashes as well. Um, so what we're doing is we are uh, focusing on all of activities uh, in that area from speeding to distraction. Uh, this week we're actually running Operation Photo File Distraction, uh, so focusing obviously on those issues that cause us to take our eyes or attention off the road. Um, but the Barossa, it's had uh, a motorcycle crash, um, we've had a ute uh, crash into a tree, we've had another person clip around about. Um, so there's a range of different factors that have been involved. But um, one of the things that we are also looking at is whether alcohol has been a contributing factor or a consistent factor in that. Uh, we know that it is, obviously, from the, from the last five years um, research and figures that we have. So, um, yeah, we are focusing a, a multifaceted approach in order to target all types of, of uh, driving behaviour, like I said, in the Barossa, but more broadly across the state as well. You've touched on motorbikes as well. They've been particularly represented um, in the road fatalities this year. How concerning is that? Yeah, look, motorcycles are obviously very concerning. Uh, eight lives lost in our roads yesterday. Uh, a serious injury crash yesterday. A 16-year-old uh, youth who was uh, riding on the Gorge Road. I understand is still in a serious uh, but stable condition, thankfully. Um, so yeah, uh, the motorcycle issue for us is a, is a consistent issue. Um, the consistencies with motorcycle crashes is all men. Um, and in a lot of cases, it's um, uh, excessive speeds involved. Uh, and I think people are overreaching their capabilities when they're riding their motorcycles and they come to grief. So, you know, what we implore the motorcycle community to do, again, the vast majority of people do do the right thing. What we do implore them to do is to ride within their limits. Um, as tempting as it is, don't speed. Um, they're quite simple messages, but unfortunately there are a few who choose not to hit them. And I guess given as well just their vulnerability on the road, they're not in a car, there's no protection surrounding them, just how much more vulnerable are they? Uh, quite simply put, for motorcyclists, there's no second chance. If you're involved in a crane, um, you're in big trouble. So that's why it's really important for you to actually do the right thing in their roads. And, you know, again, um, just because you're on a motorcycle uh, doesn't mean you're, definitely, you're putting yourself at risk, it means you're putting other road users at risk as well. Is there anything that could be done by way of the, um, the training like processes as well to sort of get that um, training education earlier out on the road and getting that experience early on? So I understand there is some conversation at the moment around uh, the type of training that um, uh, is involved, currently involved in, and uh, proposed to be involved as part of the, uh, the motorcycle learning process. Um, I think that anything that improves road safety outcomes is a good outcome. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, you can't train someone uh, to ride beyond their limits or to take risks. Um, you, know, you can teach them how to ride a motorcycle safely, but there are people out there who are deliberately choosing uh, to ride beyond their limits, to exceed the speed, to ride through our hills like cut snakes, and uh, you know, they come to grief uh, far too often. So. Again, just implore that community to, to just do the right thing, slow down, and ride in your limits. The wording in this new campaign is quite blunt. What made you settle on that particular phrase and how are you hoping it will encourage people? Yeah, the messaging is deliberately quite blunt. Um, like I said before, the cohort we're targeting is males 20 to 40 years of age, who are about 42% of the 25,500 people who have been caught drink driving over the last uh, five years. Um, we know that um, particularly blokes sitting around pubs or at houses, that's not an uncommon language for them to use. Um, we think it will resonate with them because um, no one likes to be called a selfish prick. Uh, so what we're hoping is, is that um, if they're choosing to drink drive or you know, that they actually think about this, oh, yeah, okay, so I'm a bit of a selfish prick. Um, perhaps I shouldn't drink and drive. We want them to rethink that and certainly have a, a decent conversation amongst that kind of people. Um, just on a bit of a different topic, the QR codes at the airport, why do travellers need to scan the QR code and fill out the cross-border declaration um, when they do have quite a similar purpose, contact tracing? Uh, so, look, I don't have the exact details in relation to what you're talking about there. Um, however, um, I think we're seeing the, relaxation, uh, the relaxation of uh, restrictions again uh, coming into effect next week. Um, what we don't want is any complacency amongst the community around COVID, which you know, can creep in given the excellent state that we're currently in. Um, QR codes are a really important part of our contract tracing point of view, so just encourage people to continue to use them. Will that mean that um, the requirement of QR codes, will that mean that the police presence at the desk at the airports will wind back? So we're constantly reviewing our commitments to COVID and where we need to put our efforts in. Um, 
there's again a reliance on uh, people to do the right thing. Um, you know, with businesses and the like, we all know QR codes are in businesses. Um, what we're looking for is people to continue to do the right thing because heaven forbid if we do have a bit of an outbreak, and what we want to be able to do is be in a position for SA Health to be able to do that contact tracing as best as possible, reduce the number of people who get affected by COVID, and then for everyone to be safe. And just lastly, is it confusing for travellers to have both, have to look at both the QR code and the cross-border form when most other states don't require both? Uh, I understand that every state's got a different way of doing these things. There's plenty of information on the SA Health website, so that it's pretty clear for people, I think, if you take the time to read what's required. Okay, questions for the Minister? Can I, can I come back to the uh, motorcycle? So, um, as you point out, so the, the motorcyclist that was involved in the, in the accident during the week, I think he was 16 years old, I believe it's from Hector, it was reported, that actually my electric. So, you know, as we speak this week, there could be a family uh, that is supporting a teenager who's had uh, quite a serious, by the sounds of it, a motorcycle accident. Uh, 16 year olds are exactly the types uh, of young people who are going to be protected by the uh, new graduated licensing scheme legislation. So they recently passed the Parliament um, and had, had, had support uh, far and wide. Uh, but the next phase of that is to also look at the, um, uh, the actual uh, training side of things. So we're awaiting a report. Once we uh, receive that report, we'll continue to look at what other uh, rider uh, safety training may also be uh, improved as well. When would you be expecting that report to, to be delivered? I'll, I'll, I'm waiting for that as soon as possible, so I'm hoping in the coming weeks. And, and what would that look into in terms of what changes might be made? Yeah, so the graduate licensing scheme already does things like increases the minimum age to get uh, a license. Uh, it looks at uh, um, the time that you have to uh, be on a certain license at different stages, so that as you gradually uh, graduate, obviously you, your restrictions come off. So, uh, but there's other things that we'll be looking at, such as better. Uh, on on site uh, training on the roads as well. So that will come up in the coming weeks. Minister, if we can discuss um, another topic, please. Just the leak transcript between two NFS firefighters. Hearing such two two such high ranking officials talk in that manner, does that make you frustrated? Yeah. So can I say at the outset, uh, as Minister for Emergency Services, I'm dedicated and doing everything I can to make sure that we can give our hardworking men and women on the front line the tools that they need, uh, whether it be PPE or new trucks, but giving them the tools that they need to keep themselves safe and also uh, the community. Uh, and when you hear things like this, and they're allegations, and I support the MFS investigation that's underway, but when you hear these allegations that quite frankly undermine... Uh-oh, something's the... wrong. Please try Sorry. again. Sorry. Sorry, I'm having trouble with the connection. Please try again in a moment. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, yeah. So as Emergency Services Minister, I'm doing everything I can to make sure that we can give our hardworking men and women on the front line the tools that they need to keep South Australians safe and protect lives and protect property. Uh, whether that is in trucks, whether that is in PPE, doing everything we can to give them the tools that they need. And when you hear these very serious allegations that quite frankly undermine public confidence and also public safety, that is very concerning. It's very concerning and I support the MFS inquiry that is underway. Have you had any um, conversations with Mike Morgan um, after hearing about this? So I, I met with uh, Michael Morgan yesterday. We have uh, regular uh, catch-ups, obviously, and uh, I made it very clear that any investigation I will fully support, uh, and I will wait the findings of that investigation. And will these two people be losing their jobs? Well, that would be a question for Michael Morgan. Uh, it's obviously an operational matter, but what I've said to uh, the Chief is that I fully support the investigation that's underway, and I look forward to hearing those uh, findings.